We're Axel and Marcel. Uh, we're both working for Salesforce in the Hyper Database team, which is uh, based in Munich, Germany. And both of us share a passion for building CI tooling, which brings us here. <laughs> so uh, today we want to talk about uh, tool chains with you. Uh, first, we will do a very high level overview of what they are, what problems they are trying to solve. Uh, then we will go deep. We will show our tool chain to you. And we will demonstrate some nice highlights, some things that it allows us to do. But first of all, like, how did we get there? So our database is written in C++, and it's powering a lot of Salesforce products. One of them is Tableau. And the thing about Tableau is there are several desktop applications that are offered for Windows, Mac, and Linux. So we needed to figure out how to build our database for all three operating systems. And this basically boils down to isolating your build as much as possible from the host machine. You might say, nice, I don't have that issue. <laughs> we just ship to the cloud, that's it. But then think again, like, is all of your team really using the very same version of the operating system? Are all of you really using the very same version of the compiler? Uh, is maybe some of your team using a Mac while the other half is using Linux? Or is maybe all of your team using a Mac for local development, but you're using Linux for CI CD and your prod deployments? Then you have at least partially the same issues as we do. Also, I mean, C++, I guess, is a kind of hard case, but even languages like Java, which come with a lot of extractions out of the box, they differ between versions. And uh, you can't just rely on the language on its own to do the abstraction from the host machine for you. So yeah, um, how do you get out of that mess? Tool chains. Uh, in order to understand what tool chains are, we need to recap on a very, very high level what a, or how a Bazel build works and how a tool chain can help you here. So a Bazel build can be split into artifacts and actions. An artifact is basically an input to an action, like in the case of CPP, a CPP file. And then a compile action will produce an output artifact, like an object file, which is then again an input artifact for a linker action and so on. Your whole build graph is just that, actions and artifacts. And I mean, this is all well and nice until you realize that something very crucial is missing in the picture. And that is everything that is required to make this work like a compiler, a linker, your system libraries, and so on. So if you think about it, they are a dependency for all your build actions as well. Just like all the dependencies you specify in a build file, just like all the external dependencies you have in your workspace or module file, all the toolchain artifacts are just as important. So basically, everything you do for your regular dependencies, like pinning the exact version, pinning the hash, you need to do the same for your toolchain artifacts in order for the build to be really hermetic. So what's the state there? <laughs> we heard that a couple of times by now uh, on this conference already. Uh, there is a default toolchain for C++ in rules CC, and it comes with a default configuration. It is very leaky, though. Uh, I guess it has been written for ease of onboarding. Because what it's doing is it's just looking at the usual places. If you have some sort of compiler installed, some sort of system libraries, and it's just giving that to Bazel and to the Bazel build. There's no tracking of what exactly has been in that directory and which version of which library has been used. Those are basically just leaked into the sandbox, and that's it. This is awesome to get started, um, especially if you're onboarding to Bazel. But I mean, this is very unhermetic. Um, so if you want a good isolated build across different platforms, you need to do better. How do you do that? Uh, luckily, by now, there are a lot of resources around to get you started. Uh, just for C++ alone, there are three open source projects that I'm aware of that give you a well-configured, hermetic C++ toolchain. The documentation is good, really good by now as well. There's even a tutorial, how to write toolchains. <laughs> And there have been several BaselCon talks in the past uh, about tool chains or related topics. So there is a lot of stuff around by now you can leverage. Nevertheless, when we started years ago, a lot of that stuff wasn't around yet. Which brings me to Marcel. <laughs> Thanks. 
Yeah, um, so we wished we had something to look it up, so it was actually a long year, several year plan from us uh, to finally publish parts of our tool chain for others to learn from it, basically. Um, I also realized earlier today that everyone in that room that works with C++ does have their tool chain, so you're not the target audience for that, obviously. And if someone builds them from scratch, they should probably use the new method that Matt explained earlier. Um, anyway, I hope it helps someone out there to figure out how to, to do some stuff that we do. Um, but let's talk about our tool chain. So what are the key features of it? Um, so as mentioned, we use it across several operating systems, Win Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. We use it with different architectures, Intel and ARM. And also something that we are kind of proud of, it's all native Bazel features, native rule CC, there's nothing patched. We heard, heard this a few times uh, with other talks that there's a lot of patching going on. So this is all native Bazel features, and also the cool things we show later is nothing special. Basically all native Bazel stuff. Um, and yeah, and the main point for our tool chain is that it's completely hermetic because it uses SDKs and sysroots on all operating systems really makes sure to not take anything from the host system, which makes it completely host independent, in theory, at least. Um, it can do a lot of other stuff that you can see on the right. It's not part of the talk, but if you're interested, just look at the code. Um, but let's talk about our design decisions that we took to get to a really fully hermetic C++ toolchain. And one point that we realized was it's really important that we build our own compiler packages because um, we want to have the same compiler version, the exact same compiler feature set on all operating systems. And if you've ever tried to install this exact same compiler version on several operating systems, uh, that's basically impossible. So we have to do it ourselves. Also, while we are at it, we decided to link our compiler statically, which is very helpful. Uh, someone mentioned, I think yesterday, that shared libraries can break that hermeticity or like it doesn't work on an older Ubuntu system or whatever. So that also helped us a lot. And we also realized that you can download pre-built, let's say, Clang packages in the internet where they are often missing something. Like, for example, for us, the libc++ for all target architectures was just not in there. So if you build our own compiler package, you can just put everything in there that you need. It's in theory easy. It also took us a long time to configure our Clang build. And the second part is that not, you only, not only need the compiler, but everything that would usually be taken from the host system, you have to explicitly provide through Bazel. And on Linux, that's the sysroot. It was mentioned a few times before. It's basically a subset of folders from your Linux distribution. And you can just go and copy it out of, like, let's say, CentOS image or something. Um, with a quite elegant way, we generate that one on the fly by downloading a few, I think, five RPM packages and just stitching them together, which is really nice. Uh, shout out to our colleague Robert who implemented that, and everyone said we don't need that. It's handy. <laughs> and for macOS and Windows, it's basically finding the right download packages somewhere on the websites and using them the right way to have all the files the compiler requires. And that sounds pretty simple, but it's hard in practice because it's hard to find these packages. And for example, on macOS, you can't just go and download the SDK anymore. You have to download Xcode, install it, and then copy out some folders and repackage them. And honestly, that's pretty annoying, like similar for some Windows parts. Like we can't just publish our toolchain on GitHub and link to some zip and that works. You have to do a lot of repackaging, and that's not automated. And everyone wants um, hermetic tool chains, but it's pretty hard to get to these resources. I hate it. <coughs> Sorry. And um, yeah, we also have to force the compiler at the very end not only to like, use these resources, but not to fall back to anything else on the host system. And I can really recommend to use the verbose flag on the compiler and the linker and just ask it, and it will show you which search path it's going through, so it can narrow down where you're not hermetic, and where it's still looking on the host system for stuff. OK, so that was about the hermeticity. Let's talk about the, how we support different operating systems and architectures while trying to share as much code as possible in the toolchain. And uh, the most code that's in a toolchain, in a Bazel toolchain, C++ toolchain config, 
is where the semantic is translated to the compiler flag, so the toolchain features here on the right. And in theory, it's the exact clang, same clang version of all three operating systems. You could have the exact same set of compiler flags. But in practice, we use Clang CL, the MSVC wrapper. And since it's an MSVC wrapper, it takes the Windows MSVC flags. So unfortunately, because of that, we have this whole part twice, basically once translating the features into dash dash POSIX flags and into slash Windows flags. We try to use Clang directly on Windows, but Clang CL does some magic that we couldn't really reproduce. <laughs> So uh, they, both of these like toolchain features packages share some other flags like compiler warning flags that we can just pass through Clang CL. Okay, and using those two, we can then generate, like create three uh, toolchain configs, one for each operating system, which have some operating system specific stuff like for shared libraries on Linux, for the Mac OS, minimum macOS version on Mac, stuff like that. And that basically is all the operating system specific stuff, which is the hardest part. Because architecture is actually pretty simple because we have a source on a target architecture. And the source architecture is just what is my compiler compiled for? Like is it a Windows Intel Clang build? And the target architecture is just which SDK am I using? Plus a single command line flag to the compiler that says that's my target architecture that we can pass through and that's all. So basically, by having the architecture all by the compiler and the SDK and that command line flag, and the operating system by the config, we can now wire this up in different combinations as we want it. And as you see, we only on macOS use both architectures because of Apple Silicon. Um, there will be uh, AWS Graviton for us soon, but there are no other combinations that make sense to compile or cross-compile, at least for us. Yeah, so now about some of the highlights that this toolchain allows us to do. Um, the first of all is, um, if you configure the toolchain like we did, Git and Bazel are really the only two tools you need to install on your machine to get your whole build working. Um, so if someone new joins your team, they install Git, they install Bazel, then they clone the, the repository, and they initiate the Bazel build. That's it. Like everything else will be provided by Bazel. You don't need NICs or whatever to provide exactly the right versions of whatever. <laughs> it's all done by Bazel, like even including the sysroot on, on Linux. Like if you're using for some reason a very old version of Ubuntu, you will have the very same build as all your other teammates with newer versions because even the system libraries will be shipped by Bazel. Um, the point here is that the tool chains not just give you more hermet hermeticity and therefore less bad surprises, they are also a huge win for developer productivity and ease of use of your whole CI setup. Um, yeah, I mean, to be fair, there are other means to achieve more or less the same. You could also all settle for exactly the same operating version, maybe use some sort of virtualization like VM or Docker image that you give to everyone and ask them to build always in that Docker image. That brings you roughly to the same spot but we think there are some downsides, like especially if you want to use that across multiple operating systems. Um, yeah, so there are several means to get there. We went the, with the pure Bazel approach. We like it. We think it's very lean uh, and makes things very easy for, for the users. Um, the next one is automatic skipping of incompatible targets. This is a quite basic toolchain feature, but it's, it's awesome every time. So, uh, once you have your constraints and your platforms defined, uh, you can mark the actions in your build graph as either compatible or incompatible to, to certain criteria. Like this test only works on Windows, or this bi binary only builds on an ARM machine. And Bazel will then, when you initiate a build, check what machine it is running on and then either add or remove that from your build graph automatically. You don't need to do anything further here. And this goes beyond just like the regular operating system and CPU architecture stuff. Anything you want can be defined as a Bazel constraint. So say you have a test that requires special hardware attached to the machine, like you're an embedded developer, for example, <laughs> or uh, you require a license file to be present on the machine, 
All of that can be defined as a Bazel constraint. <coughs> and then Bazel will add or remove that action from the build graph depending on whether the host machine is fulfilling the constraint or not. And this is basically given for, to you for free. Next one is um, you can leverage the information Bazel has about the host machine to do stuff like naming the output artifacts. This is something we make heavy use of. <clears throat> so our database, uh, basically every CI build for every commit is uploading the binary of the database to Artifactory. And then for every commit, you have a folder. And in there, there's a Linux installer, a Mac installer, and so on. And like, we don't need any additional scripts to do the renaming. Like Bazel will automatically name the artifacts depending on what machine built them. This is just one example of how you can leverage the information. Um, there might be other use cases for you. Uh, next one is <clears throat> make Bazel pick the right dependencies for you. So in some cases, dependencies differ between operating systems. In our case, OpenSSL, for example, uh, we on purpose decided not to include it as source code and then build it as part of our build because for security reasons, we wanted to stick with the like attached or the original build system for OpenSSL. So we have pre-compiled OpenSSL, and then Bazel needs to know which one to pick. And you can hide that away in an alias, and then all your developers can simply depend on crypto. And Bazel will take care of giving them the right crypto, depending on which machine they're on. Um, so this is, again, making it very easy and convenient for your developers. And one more example we have is creating universal binaries on macOS. And I really like this because it leverages other cool Bazel features, native Bazel features with only a few lines of code and the tool chain we mentioned earlier with the like cross architecture and stuff. So it was mentioned several times, I think in the last days, uh, universal packages. In this case, it's the universal binaries from macOS where it's like one binary that contains machine code for, in this case, ARM and Intel architecture. And you can create such a universal binary by calling one tool on macOS, pointing it to like both the single executables, and we'll just fuse them together, basically. So what we do is we write one rule with exactly one action that does this one command line call, and it has one dependency. And here we have like an example CC binary with like a small dependency tree. And now we have a transition that we attach to that single dependency and tell that transition to split the dependency tree and change the architecture. And now Bazel duplicates the whole dependency tree and will build everything above that CC binary twice, once for the first architecture, once for the second. And that's pretty cool, but also really confusing, because usually when you write CC binary in a build file, you think about like it will only produce one output. It will only run once. And in this case, it will actually be executed twice and produce two outputs. And the question is usually you know like your outputs end up in that Bazel out folder at one specific position. So in this case, it will be like on the left, the default Darwin opt folder. And on the right, Bazel will create a new output directory with like a hash, which is the hash over the properties that change from that transition. But you don't even need to know that path because the rule at the top will get the path like you usually get the path for a dependency and can just hand it to your action and then execute it. Um, and I quickly want to show like how simple that transition even looks like. So at the top we can see the implementation of the transition, which simply says like instead of saying I want to override one option, I want to have two times a dependency tree and override that option one time it's for macOS x64 in this case, macOS ARM. And at the very bottom, you can see these two lines that the rule will use to get that dependency. And it's just an array access on split attribute dependency to get like the path to those two binaries for these two different architectures. And another thing I want to show which is cool that was actually also a use case from us is you can transition forth and back several times in that dependency graph. So, Quickly explaining what we see here. So we have like a zip package that contains a few CC binaries. And then we have, in this case, some dummy rule at the very top that just makes sure we build that zip package for several architectures. Uh, no universal binary in this case. 
but there's one CC binary in that zip package that always has to be for one architecture. In this case, it was just not ported to ARM yet. And it should always be for uh, x86. And then there's a transition on that dependency that always forces that single architecture. And what happens is that while earlier we split the whole dependency tree, it now fuses again at the bottom. And yeah, Basil unfortunately doesn't recognize that coming from both ways basically is the exactly same binary. So it will unfortunately build it twice by default, which is bad because that was basically the biggest binary in our repository. But as so often, if you have a problem, you, if you search long enough, you find some obscure long Basel flag that I put here that solves the problem, which is diff against baseline, and then Basel will recognize that it's actually the same and will only build it once, and that whole code works. And yeah, I like that example because it's so simple, it's only a few lines of code, and it all works out of the box with Basel. Yeah, so what did we learn today? Um, Basel toolchains help you to isolate your build even further from the host machine than default Basel already does. Actually, in the case of C++, one has to say that the, the main promise of Basel of hermetic and reproducible builds is only partially fulfilled if you stay with the default configuration. It is very leaky by default. So in a way, I mean, that's a thing also why someone suggested earlier to take away the default configuration and force everyone to write a hermetic toolchain from the start. I'm not sure if I would go with that proposal, but uh, if you are serious about your C++ build, you will have to. And again, there are several open source projects that can help you. Um, yeah. C++ is a, like maybe a very hard case, but again, like the same is true for other languages like Java and so on. Um, yeah, setting up a hermetic toolchain is hard. It takes a lot of effort, but in our experience, it's like an initial effort you need to get through. Once it's working, it's working. Long-term maintenance is rather minimal, at least in our experience. So um, once you made it through that initial invest, you have long-term payoff, <laughs> right? Uh, because the longer you keep using that, the better your return of invest is just getting. Um, yeah, this is basically our, our main thing we wanted to show you. Again, like the, the, we open sourced the code. It's really a dump of our internal code. No stupid examples. It's really the thing we use in production. Um, it's kind of hard to explain a full-blown uh, toolchain in 20 minutes. So we picked just a couple of highlights and put the code online for you. Um, we think that's yeah, the best we can do right now. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out. We are both in the Slack in the Basil Slack, and uh, we're also here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for coming, and uh, we are open for questions. Have you run into any issues uh, building for different um, Linux distros? Like, for instance, say Ubuntu, Yummy, Focal, and so on. You, you build for one, and then is your, the application you're building actually uh, portable to, to, other, to another one? Have, have you experience with that? Um, yeah, I think I can take that. Um, yes. <laughs> so actually, we've been shipping, like, the product we ship is also like one big statically linked binary. And it's built with a very old CentOS 7 root because it has to co be compatible with all of that. And Tableau says, like, Tableau server runs with at least CentOS 7. And yes, if you do that, it basically runs on everything newer. Yeah. Like every, I think it officially supports CentOS and Red Hat, but we didn't have problems. And maybe just to add to that, um, so I mean, executing it is fine. When it comes to the pure Basel build, like recently we had to migrate our CI runners from CentOS something to Red Hat Enterprise 9. Um, and we thought this will be a cakewalk because uh, we have such an awesome hermetic toolchain. We were surprised. Uh, there are so many weird things. Like, I mean, the, the Linux sandbox in Basel, for example, is using PID namespaces to, for like extra hermeticity. Somehow, the PIDs in that PID namespace are seeded differently in Red Hat than they were in, in CentOS. <laughs> and this caused flaky tests in our end. So um, even with a toolchain like ours, um, there's still something leaking in your sandbox. You will never get that away. Uh, but at least for us, it's, yeah, it's good, or good enough to, to ship the binaries and be sure that they will be able to execute and run. Yeah. 
Are you able to cross compile from Linux to Mac or from Mac ARM to x86? Can I? Yeah. yeah, good question. This was always my dream to do something like that, but there's re it doesn't really make sense because Windows and Mac don't want you to cross compile from some other machine. So we could, in theory, what we want to do is like take the cheapest, beefiest Linux machines and compile to all the other systems. But usually the problem with cross compiling is that you can't test it, <laughs> that you can't run it, you can't test it. And since, especially for base, like building and testing is very much entangled, there's just no need. We could, I always wanted to try it, it's probably working, but yeah, there's no need for us. And how are you dealing with the remote execution? Have you have trouble in uh, synchronizing all the uh, hermetic tool chain with the nodes, remote nodes? Um, so um, we, we don't use remote execution yet, sadly, okay. like at least not in <coughs> production CI. We did that as a hackathon project a couple of times by now. Um, yeah, for reasons I think I, I cannot go into, um, we, we don't use it yet. <laughs> but let me Thanks. say, we were surprised that like for a two-day hackathon, it worked out of the box with our toolchain. Yeah, yeah. That made us very happy, but yeah. we don't use it in production. Yeah, again, yeah. because the toolchain ship, ships everything you yeah. need, right? So um, having a good toolchain is a very good preparation for remote execution, yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Have you tried the different packaging formats like IS4 and other stuff? I think you mentioned about universal installer or something like that. Did you get it? Pardon? Can you repeat? Like, uh, have you tried other packaging formats like IS4, RPM, something like that? To generate the, send, the Linux sysroot? No, no, what, whatever you want, you're shipping, like. Because ta Tableau, you have to ship. Oh, um, we are not building the final Tableau product. We are just some part in the background, and all we deliver to the Tableau mm -hmm. world is basically one statically linked binary. Okay. So we don't ship an RPM or anything. OK. And uh, have you faced any problems in uh, kind of a binary format when you're cross-compiling? No. The object, object files, because we, we, at least we are experiencing the binary that is produced. Uh, the Bazel alters a little bit of flags. Uh, then we are seeing some differences in output, uh, binary output. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah, we can talk later. Yeah. 